two minutes to <laughs> came back and then you can continue with the yeah. selector. Let me start showing my screen. Yeah, thank you. I think almost all people is there, so whenever you want. All right, so I'll slowly start. So I hope people had a chance to, to grab, grab a nice coffee. Uh, so just to a brief recap, so we talk about atomistic simulations and we talk about translating uh, materials and molecules into design matrices using representations. Now it's the machine learning potential part. Uh, so the machine learning potential uh, basically is rumored to be this device that have the accuracy that has the accuracy on par with initial methods, but at a cost that is just a little bit higher than force fields. Um, so, so uh, to put it uh, uh, like it, to compare it with density functional theory. So the density functional theory can handle hundreds of atoms on a time scale of picoseconds. And with the machine learning potentials, uh, we can do much, much more. This is mostly because of the favorable linear scaling uh, compared with the cubic scaling uh, in the case of uh, DFD. And uh, we can, uh, I often run it just on a laptop. Now, uh, so how does it work? So first of all, I would like to use a black box view, uh, this black box view. So we have uh, certain configurations uh, of atoms in our training set. We label them, uh, meaning we compute the energy and forces using DFT, although it can be, be uh, other electronic structure methods. And then we feed this information uh, to the neural network, although it could be also a Gaussian process or something else. And then when the new configurations come in, then the machine learning, uh, the, the machine learning model can give us a speedy uh, predictions of the energy and forces associated with these new structures. And of course, uh, the black box view may not be very satisfying to you. So here's an alternative view that starts from the atomic environments. So if I invite you to look at these two uh, configurations here, right? What do you see? And, and your answer might be that, okay, on the right, we have like a solid like configuration on, on the left, this looks amorphous. And the reason why you think uh, this guy here looks like a solid, it's because if we look in the, uh, if we look at individual atomic environments, if we sit on an atom and look at our neighborhood, we see very similar atomic environments over and over again. Uh, in this case, it's FCC. Now, actually, even within the liquid, we have these uh, similar atomic environments. Uh, it's very hard to see, but 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 it's there. We can even uh, find solid light environments in the liquid. I'll elaborate this point later when we move on to the examples. And of course, uh, this is very hard to identify using naked eye, and therefore uh, we rely on these popular representations, including the SOAP re representations that we have talked about during the previous lecture to characterize the atomic environments so we can compare them. So what does it mean in practice that we have similar atomic environments over and over again? This means that 
if we compute all the configurations using a uh, quantum mechanical methods, it's quite wasteful. The reason for that is that, so if we take the uh, locality, if we take the nearsightedness approximation, if we assume the energy uh, of associated with each environment is almost almost completely determined by the environment itself, by, its, uh, by, by the nearest neighbors. Then we encounter these environments over and over again. So, but each time, if we have to recompute them by solving quantum mechanics, that doesn't seem too wise. So we can, so what we can do instead is that we, um, in our memory, we have a, a, a we have a collection of atomic environments, and the together with the energy and forces associated with these environments. So we have this in our memory, and when a new configuration comes in, when new environment comes in, we can just compare this new environment to the existing ones in our memory, and then give a, and and give a prediction. So to summarize, to construct a machine learning potential, we basically follow a two-step process. I mean, regardless of what kind of machine learning algorithm or what kind of representation that you actually use, we first collect a bunch of environments uh, and then we do a uh, interpolation, right? So that basically sums up the machine learning potential. And with that, I would like to uh, move on uh, to, um, uh, to the, the, the applications. So let me share my screen again. Okay, cool. Applications, uh, the system of water. So this is a ubiquitous system, uh, but the system of water has many mysterious properties that we often take for granted. So for example, the ice floats on water. And that's quite unusual because typically we think solid to be often denser than the liquid. And the liquid water is densest at four degrees Celsius. There's also a significant uh, difference between heavy water and light water. We have many ice faces, uh, at least 18 of them. And uh, one of the mystery, one of uh, another mystery is that we have two uh, polymorphs ambient pressure polymorphs. We have the hexagonal ice, 1H, and the cubic ice, uh, 1C. Right. So uh, energetically speaking, the, the, the en enthalpy of them are basically degenerate. However, in nature, we only see hexagonal ice. That's why all the snowflakes are hexagonal. Uh, and why is that? So uh, we trained a machine learning potential. This is trained uh, based on the hybrid DFT, rep B0 plus uh, the D3 dispersion correction. Uh, we train using the Baylor polynomial neural network, and there are about like 1,000, like 1,500 configurations in the training set, both uh, the energy and forces. The training set is publicly available, and you are more than welcome to look at it and play with it. So this is the standard uh, 45 degree line that all the machine learning work show. And, and then we can use the, the machine learning potential to do actual uh, simulation. So here I'm showing the density isobar uh, for three phases of water. We have the liquid showing in red. This is from simulation, as well as the cubic ice and hexagonal ice. Cubic ice and hexagonal ice have the same volume. Now, let's first look at the water. We have two lines here. So what are they? So the dashed line is from a classical simulations treating nuclei as classical particles. And uh, the solid line is accounting for uh, nuclear quantum effects that we have explained before. 
uh, using the path integral molecular dynamics formulas. So you see, actually, the nuclear quantum effects makes uh, liquid water a little bit denser by about 1%. Uh, and also for ice, it makes ice a little bit denser. That's quite counterintuitive. We also capture the density maxima of liquid water very nicely at about like four degrees Celsius. So the experimental results are marked here using the stars. Uh, we are just uh, a, a couple of percent within the experimental, uh, the experimental uh, observation. And here I show the radial distribution function, oxygen, 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 hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen. And again, from a classical molecular dynamic simulations, as well as the path integral molecular dynamic simulations. So for oxygen, oxygen, like, uh, the nuclear quantum effects doesn't play an important role. But for the oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen, hydrogen, we really have to turn on the nuclear quantum effects to match uh, very nicely the experimental observation. Now, just a brief recap of uh, thermodynamic integration. And again, I got the sign wrong here. This should be uh, flipped. So uh, in, in reality, uh, in, in practice, what we do is like we do a thermodynamic integration from a harmonic system uh, to a classical system. Uh, this is the first step of the integration. And then we, we do the integration from the classical system to the nuclear, uh, uh, to the quantum mechanical nuclei, uh, considering nuclear quantum effects. So, uh, so as a reminder, like for this last step, we are just integrating uh, using the quantum mechanical kinetic energy. Now I'm going to show something that uh, often make people feel uncomfortable. So uh, I compute the, the classical uh, chemical potential difference between the aforementioned ice I see the cubic ice and hexagonal ice. And I'm, I did that using two different fits of the neural network potential. And you can see the results are different. Right? They are not just uh, quantitatively different and you can see the sign is different. Although like arguably uh, the, the, the energy scale here is very small. So we are looking at milli electron volts uh, per molecule. But still, this kind of tells us just using the machine learning potential may not be able to capture the very fine uh, difference uh, between free energies. So what do we do? So and to, to present this uh, sort of schematically, so this is the problem that we have. So we have a potential energy surface, which is our ground truth, which is DFT in this case. And then we have the machine learning potential, uh, potential energy surface. Now, they two are very, very similar, but there will inevitably be some small differences, right? And, uh, and, and the difference may come from different reasons. So for example, the machine learning potential doesn't incorporate long range interaction, but obviously uh, it, it's there. Uh, and, and the difference may also come from maybe the training set is a little bit sparse at certain points. Right, and then there's also uh, the this residue difference uh, because of the fit. Now, how do we promote the machine learning potential results to the DFT level? How do we do this uh, correction? And we not just want to do this correction for a particular configuration, but for all the relevant configuration. So to write down this uh, mathematically, we can write down the Gibbs free energy of the system described by DFT. So this is the log of the partition function. And we can do the same for the machine learning potential. Now, the difference between the actual uh, chemical Gibbs free energy and the machine learning one can be 
written in this uh, free energy perturbation form. So we are taking the average of the exponential of the difference between uh, the ensemble as different uh, ensemble average of the exponential of the difference for each configuration. So typically, uh, free energy perturbation converge rather uh, horribly. However, uh, in this case, because the two potential energy surfaces are very, very similar, uh, we can actually converge this estimator uh, very rapidly. Uh, typically, we use like uh, less than 100 configuration. So we compute this term for different phases of water under different thermodynamic conditions. Here I divide the Gibbs free energy by the number of molecules so we can plot out the chemical potential. So the, uh, the difference is small, right, on the order of uh, one milli electron volts uh, per molecule. But this makes a difference. After I put this correction term back on top, uh, this uh, graph that I showed before, the chemical potential difference between cubic ice and cathogen ice, then I'm getting converged results. The predictions from after correct them, the predictions using two fits of neural network are consistent. So to uh, summarize, uh, the, here's the workflow of the initial thermodynamics. So the first part is what we have talked about before. We do a thermodynamic integration to compute the classical and quantum mechanical free energies. And then in the end, we always add a correction term on top to promote the neural network to the initial level of theory. So here are the results. We have the cubic eyes and we have the hexagonal eyes. We compute the neural network results. We add the correction and then we add nuclear quantum effects. So here we can see nuclear quantum effects actually has a major effect. It significantly stabilizes hexagonal eyes to make it ever so slightly more stable than the cubic one. So without nuclear quantum effects, maybe the snowflake that we, we see in nature will not have this a nice hexagonal shape. Uh, and another one is the chemical potential difference between ice and liquid water. And we compute it using umbrella sampling uh, on, on like coexistence systems. We first compute the neural network results and the same story. We correct it to the TFT level and we add nuclear quantum effects. Uh, we can even consider not just uh, H2O, but D2O, the heavy water as well. Now, uh, also the, to compare with experiments, and we can see we are really uh, within like a hair uh, compared with experiments. And not just that, the, even the difference between the melting point of D2O and H2O, we can predict that uh, very accurately as well. And notice that the uh, um, D2O and classical water, which is the red line uh, and uh, the green line for the D2O here, uh, almost overlap. So the classical water and D2O have the same chemical potential. And why is that? This is because when we doing when we were doing the thermodynamic integration, and we look at the the integrand, there's actually a, a, a reversal of uh, this integral. So there's a little bit of cancellation of nuclear quantum effect. So this is for water. The next example is on hydrogen. And then we will also dig a little bit deeper on this locality argument on this near sightedness. So for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen is the dominant component in the center of uh, giant planets such as uh, Jupiter. So what happens is like on the surface, uh, the pressure uh, is low and the uh, hydrogen it takes the familiar uh, dimolecular form. Uh, it, 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 uh, and, and, but as we approach the center, the, the pressure goes up and uh, the hydrogen starts to dissociate. They become uh, atomic as well as metallic. 
So experimentally, this is very difficult to prove. So uh, this is a, a deeply controversial topic of uh, where, on, uh, on what, under what pressure and temperature does this transition from molecular hydrogen to a uh, metallic hydrogen happen, as well as the nature of this transition, if it's like first order or, uh, or smooth transition. So using a uh, DFT molecular dynamics, like this transition, because we are restricted to the small system and relatively short simulation time, the transition uh, can mostly only be a uh, probe from this uh, kink on the equation of states. However, with the neural network potential, we are able uh, to scan the whole phase diagram. And, and so here I'm showing the, uh, the, the color scale here is the average order parameter. Here is defined by the fraction of the bonded hydrogen. So here at uh, low pressure, low temperature, we have mostly molecular hydrogen. And at higher pressure and higher temperature, uh, we have uh, atomic hydrogen. Now this black line here is the melting line uh, that we have computed. And then the purple line and uh, the orange line here are the location of the density maxima and the heat capacity maxima. So that is if we plot out the density and the heat capacity of the system uh, under uh, isobar conditions, and then we trace the location of the maxima and we plot on the phase diagram. So, so that, that is the purple and uh, the orange line here. Now, from this graph, uh, the transition looks smooth, but we want to characterize it a little bit more. And we explain the system in terms of a, a regular solution model. So in this picture, we are saying that, um, uh, we're saying like the system can be understood as the mixture of two liquids, like the atomic liquid and the molecular liquid. So in the regular solution model that some of us might have studied during the undergrad, the total uh, gives free energy of the system as, the, uh, as a function of the fraction of one of the component can be written as the, uh, the sum of the chemical potential uh, from this component and a mixing entropy, right? So this is the mixing entropy as well as an enthalpic penalty of mixing. So uh, it, you, under this regular solution model, when the temperature is high, uh, our system uh, mix perfectly. Uh, when the temperature, uh, but, but when the temperature is below the critical point, then the two liquids phase separate. So now the game is that we want to compute this free energy profile for our system so we can understand it, we can fit it to the regular solution model. So we did just that. Uh, we computed uh, the free energy profile as molecular, as the function of molecular fraction using metadynamic simulations. And then we fit this profile, free energy profile to the regular model, regular solution model and get the parameters as well as the critical point. So here's the critical point that we have look at here. It's uh, just uh, on the melting line. So above the melting line, the system is super critical according to us. And not just that, uh, the machine learning potential also correctly captured the ground state crystal structure at different pressure. So solid hydrogen is known to be very complicated and uh, it can form uh, many, many, many polymorphs at low temperature and different pressure. And the melting light also looks okay compared with previous experimental measurements. Okay, so uh, the extent of, is there any questions yes. related? Yes. Could you replay the questions? I think now is the moment. Yes. Okay, so 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 there's a question uh, from an Andre. Uh, maybe 
Like, does Andre want to speak up? Hi. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, so you were talking uh, sort of in the big beginning of the second session that for the uh, neural networks, we essentially collect the different environments and then use them to essentially estimate the energy instead of recalculating the environments again and again. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if in that data set that you collect, you collect specifically the environments for single molecules or if you're storing the snapshots of a system, say at particular temperature or whatnot. So, right. But, yeah. but, but. so the systems in the training set are all bulk structures. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, they are all configurations from liquid water. And the reason behind that, I'll actually uh, explain uh, in a bit. Okay. Thank you. And uh, and, and then like uh, there's a question from Yu Xie. Uh, do you want to speak up? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I want to ask that uh, is the correction to the machine learning model, uh, the term uh, U minus UML uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. is it from training a residual uh, neural network? Um, uh, so uh, in principle, I think one can do that. Uh, I, I, I I have, but I I also have seen people who train the difference, not between the neural network and the DFT, but they train a difference between two different levels of electronic structure calculation. Let's say you can train a difference between a hybrid DFT and a PBE, for example. I have seen that. So in principle, uh, it is possible, although, but but I but are you thinking about training the difference in potential energy surface or training the difference in, in the free energy difference? Because they are different, right? One is a high dimensional object and the other is a, a number, is it's a scalar as a function of pressure and temperature. Um, okay, so here um, you might uh, require the DFT calculation for this correction term. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Or maybe I, my understanding is, uh, is kind of wrong. So uh, I can explain in practice how this is done. Right? Mm -hmm. So in practice, what we do is that at a certain thermodynamic condition, let's say I'm interested in this correction term at 300 Kelvin and one gigapascal, right? So I run MD simulation using the machine learning potential at that condition, and I collect on correlated configurations, right? And then I put these selected configurations generated from the machine learning Hamiltonian back to DFT. So I can compute this difference and uh, from which I compute this delta mu. I see, I see. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, maybe like I'll, I'll take uh, one more question uh, from Christian, uh, from Christian. I want to ask uh, between the PBE and B12 lip functional, which describe the best parameter for machine learning potential. Uh, th so this is uh, this depends on the on the system. So 
so so so there are two things here, right? So there's the underlying uh, electronic structure calculation, right? So for all the machine learning fits, it's garbage in, garbage out. If the underlying theory is not great, then obviously we won't have a good machine learning potential. Right. So the first step is always to uh, benchmark a DFD so that we, we select a good reference, right? So another, uh, uh, so another uh, thing is that, uh, uh, like, so the selection is not always possible. So for water is clearer which functional is better. For high pressure hydrogen, it's a little bit of a uh, guesswork. Now, uh, so, and then once we select the, the underlying theory, then the, the question is about the quality of the fit. And, and, and as of now, this is still a little bit of art and one needs to validate and refine the potential and so on. Okay. okay. So, so, so for now, I'll move back uh, to the talk. Uh, this, this last part about uh, uh, this argument of locality because we were explaining everything in terms of atomic environments, right? We stress this concept over and over again, but how good is it uh, as an approximation? So how local things are? So we are going to explore uh, this problem. So again, this is just brief recap. Machine learning potential starts from atomic environment and uh, each atomic environment gives us atomic energy and we sum this up to get the total energy of our system, right? So let's look at the atomic energy. So here I'm plotting out on the X and Y axis, I'm plotting out the atomic energies uh, from two different machine learning potential. So this is for the water. And, and they are not correlated at all. So at first I thought, okay, this is maybe due to how the energy is partitioned between oxygen and hydrogen. So now I'm comparing the molecular energies, which is the sum of the atomic energy of oxygen and hydrogen in each water molecule from the two fits of the machine learning potential. Still, they are not correlated. And this basically tells us that the atomic energy uh, that, that we rely on very heavily in machine learning potential is really a mathematical device. It doesn't really uh, carry a deep uh, physical, uh, physical meaning. Now, the reason why I started looking into this is because uh, back then I, I was thinking about the problem of heat conductivity, which is, uh, uh, so heat conductivity is a very important parameter that goes into the power system. It's also a sort of input parameter for fluid dynamics and uh, other type of continuum modeling. Now, uh, the way of compute, the typical way of computing the heat conductivity is to use the green kubo relationship, which is basically from the, uh, by taking the integral of the autocorrelation function of heat flux. Now, what is the problem here? So the integral cost to integrate to infinite time, but we know that uh, if we take the autocorrelation, there's always a noise, there's a Gaussian noise. So if you actually integrate to infinite time, uh, the, 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 the uh, sum is divergent. But if you cut off uh, prematurely, and if the signal does have a long decaying tail, then you put a bias on your estimate. And moreover, uh, the computational heat flux asks for the atomic energy that we have talked about, and also a pairwise force, uh, pairwise forces between pairs of atoms. So none of these are well defined uh, in the machine learning potential setting, as well as in many other settings as well. Okay, so luckily we, we've actually found a formulation that allows us to compute heat conductivity independent from the green kubo relation, independent from the heat flux. So how it works is that we have this particle density field, right? So this is a well-defined quantity. 
And then we do a Fourier expansion of this term in space uh, to give us this row tilt uh, that is uh, for uh, at each wave vector k. Now, uh, if you do some hydrodynamics uh, equation, which uh, I mean, my math was not good enough to do that, but these things were solved uh, in the 60s uh, by, by fluid dynamics people. Now, turns out the autocorrelation function of this rho tilt has uh, two modes. So there's one mode that is actually an exponentially decay mode, which is uh, the heat mode that carries the information of the heat conductivity. And the second mode is actually an auxiliary mode that uh, is, is related to the sound uh, propagation. Uh, so here's the hydrodynamic equation, uh, which I will skip. So, uh, and then I, we did just that. We computed the, so first of all, we want to do some benchmark. So we benchmark on the Leonard Jones because for Leonard Jones it's a pairwise potential and we can compute that, compute the heat conductivity uh, very easily using the green kubo relation. We compute the autocorrelation function and we fit to the hydrodynamic expression. You can see the fit and the simulation, uh, actual simulation are basically overlap perfectly. And we can also look at the power spectrum. From power spectrum, we see two peaks. Uh, the first peak is the exponential heat mode that we talk about, and the second peak is the sun propagation. And then we compute the heat conductivity from at different kappa, and then we extrapolate that to k equal to zero, which is the microscopic heat conductivity, which can also be computed from the green kubo relationship. And they agree. We do this at different thermodynamic conditions. So basically this, what we call the wave method gives consistent estimate with green kubo for Leonard Jones at many different conditions. Uh, so with that, we can use this method. Uh, with such validation, we can use this method for other systems. So for example, uh, we computed the heat conductivity of the high pressure hydrogen. Uh, again, we compute the autocorrelation function and, and from there, we extract out the heat conductivity. Okay, so for the last part, so this is a little bit uh, uh, bittersweet story, but uh, the next example may build you more confidence about the locality of the machine learning potential. So this is related to the question uh, has been previously asked. So what is in the training set? We have the bulk liquid uh, water in the training set of the machine learning potential. And, but remember that we actually use the model to, uh, com uh, to compute for cubic ice and hexagonal ice, and they work fine. So I was thinking, like, how, uh, how much can we extrapolate from this machine learning potential? Is it applicable to other ice phases as well? So we took from this study uh, that has uh, that that collected many ice phases, some uh, actual experimentally confirmed ones, like uh, uh, all the experimentally confirmed ones, as well as many hypothetical ones. So they plot, they did this map using sketch map. You can also uh, do a PCA map of the ice phases. And then we took, uh, we took the representative 54 phases of ice and then uh, using the same framework that we have talked about, we compare them with the liquid water configurations uh, in our training set. Now you can see ice and water, they appear at different places on our PCA map, which is understandable, they should be different. However, the interesting thing is that if we instead do not compare the global structures, but instead of just projecting down the atomic environments, we found out that local environments in liquid water completely, almost completely covers the environments that we encounter in the 54 ice phases. So what does this mean? This means that uh, we have the, all the, we have collected all the relevant atomic environments for these ice phases, although our training set are completely built on liquid water. 
So because of that, this machine learning potential trained on liquid water is able to predict various properties such as density, lattice energy, as well as the phonon density of states. So for, these are 54 phases and we can zoom in to look at individual ones. And uh, for each one, the agreement uh, is magnificent. And, and because of uh, and because of that, we are also able to use this machine learning potential to compute the phase diagram of water, right? Uh, so we have the again we have the machine learning prediction, but we always add the correction terms on top, and uh, we can choose not to correct it to the. Uh, ref B zero D three, which is the theory that we use to fit the machine learning potential. We can also correct it to a different DFT levels theory, such as P B zero D three and B three lip D three. Right, those gave they gave different, uh, slightly different phase diagram. And over, overall, the agreement with experiment is very good. It's like better than the existing empirical water potential. Uh, and again, nuclear quantum effects here play a very important role to shift uh, the boundary around. Uh, and, and, and that's basically it. So the take home message here would be that uh, um, machine learning potential is a very powerful tool. Now we can compute the initial phase diagram. Uh, we, there are still a lot of things we do not fully understand about machine learning potential, and there are, uh, I think there will be a lot going on in that direction, particularly for the long-range interaction. And then uh, it's probably also a good time to revise uh, the typical simulation, the typical tools that we use uh, to better utilize the the, the, the like state of the art machine learning potential. And with that, that's the end of my talk. And I would like to answer uh, more questions. Okay, so uh, back, back to the Q and A. Um, so there's a question from uh, Mahamud. Hi. Hello. Uh, uh, I wanted to know, uh, uh, is this uh, correction to MLP uh, just for uh, light elements because of uh, nuclear motion? Mm. Thank you. So, so they are actually two separate uh, things, right? So, uh, Nuclear quantum effects correction is needed for light elements, right? So imagine if you run ab initial MD simulation, you still need to consider nuclear quantum effects. Now, uh, the correction term is needed uh, if you want to correct the residue error in your machine learning potential. And that error is because your potential energy surface is slightly different from your ground truth. And that is a fact, regardless if you run MD simulation or path integral molecular dynamic simulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then there's a question from uh, William. William, could you please turn on the, your audio? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, if I understood correctly, uh, when you were trying to train the neural network on the data, you need to define some local environments for the particles that, that seems to be very similar across the sample. What will happen when you have uh, phase transition where the local environments can be really large. 
how can you define that kind of local environment? Right. So uh, thanks for the question. So 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 uh, so the in practice, how do we decide the local environment is a little bit by a uh, trial and error. So what you do it so. It's there's a trade off, right? So if you select a smaller environment, then uh, the neural network is little, uh, it's much cheaper to be or train and to use, right? But when you select a larger environment, that gives you more uh, long, long, long range interaction, but it's also more expensive to train and to use, right? So in practice, what we do is I always select different local environment and train the network uh, separately using them and see what happens and pick an optimal uh, combination. Now, related to your question of the phase transition, right? So uh, personally, I'm not sure if phase transition would dramatically change the use of the size of atomic environment. So for example, in this case of liquid water, we always use six angstrom for our cutoff throughout. And uh, uh, as the, in my previous talk, we have shown like the liquid water, uh, the machine learning potential describe both liquid water and ice phases very well. Thank you, and thank you for the very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we are a little bit, one minute over time, maybe I take two more questions and, and... okay. Like, uh, so there's a question from, uh, Horn, if if that's how the name is pronounced. Yes. Juan, we cannot listen to you. I think maybe you can read the questions because okay. Juan is on mute, but. Okay, I'll do that. So Juan asks, when our results do, don't fully coincide with experiments, can we reverse engineer the neural network potential to reconstruct a neighboring environment? I'm thinking about a distribution function or a GOVAR or, or something like that. I, so, so from what I understood from this question, right? So this, there, there's a residue uh, difference uh, between the machine learning prediction and, and experiments. Um, which come from different reasons. The most important reason probably being that uh, the DFT functional that we use involve uh, approximations, right? So I do think there, there will be a lot of opportunity to add another correction term on top of machine learning potential to make it match experiments a, a little bit better. Now, I don't think this has been done before, although in principle, since that people routinely do that when they build force fields for uh, proteins and RNAs and DNAs, um, I think this seems to be possible, although I haven't seen anything in that direction yet. Oh, okay, so uh, let's take... Uh, one last question from uh, Robson. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. I'm, I'm just wondering since we can map the phase diagrams, if we can also determine the nature of the phase boundaries from the ML piece. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, so, so, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm a very uh, cautious, uh, I, I, I personally, I'm a little bit on the cautious side, 
right? So when you say the boundary of the, the, the so the nature of the phase transition, so in the, in the case of ice and liquid water, so this is, uh, when we go from one phase to the other, this is typically through nucleation, right? So there will be an interface uh, between ice and liquid, for example. Now, I, intuitively, I think if you have an interface, long range interactions gonna be more important compared with if we just have the bulk phases, right? So I think there, there uh, because the machine learning potential is short range. So uh, I, I feel a little bit uneasy to use the machine learning potential to characterize a uh, interfacial phenomenon, although maybe it's not a problem. So, so that's my sense. Thank you. Thank you. Being, uh, as you prefer, you can go ahead. We have time on Zoom, but if you cannot continue, we can stop here. So uh, okay. It... okay, so maybe like uh, another uh, two more questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's see. Uh... Okay, so there's a question from, uh... I, I'm sorry if I, I, I will mispronounce your name. Uh, my Tane. Okay. My Tane, yes. Uh, hi, uh, you actually answered my, my question. I had some uh, Zoom problems, but you, you went on, on that uh, later. So thank you. Okay. And then there's a question from Mauricio. I hope nobody is keeping a scoreboard to see how many names I have mispronounced today. Okay, let's see if Mauricio turns on <laughs> and meet. Mauricio, you should unmute yourself. Okay. He's not replaying, so let's read yourself. You uh, okay. So uh, Mauricio, uh, if, if that, that, that is the name, uh, I understand machine learning potentials are very hard to generalize, uh, i.e there cannot be a machine learning equivalent to CHARM or OPLS, which works well for some families of materials. Uh, can you elaborate on this? So, uh, so the machine learning potential that I have trained, also because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm on the lazy side, are for a single system, but I have seen machine learning potentials for a class of uh, molecules. I think the ones come to my mind is the Ani. Uh, I think it's from uh, Alexandra. Alexandra, uh, what, what's his last name? I don't but remember. It's, it's the Ani CXX. So that, that thing. I think they were trained on uh, QM9. And, uh, they were trained on small molecular molecular data set, and as a result, it's applicable uh, to. Uh, a very large collection of small molecules as well. And I believe the Shinet uh, from Klaus Muller and uh, uh, Alex Tachenko and their co-workers, it should also be applicable. I think it was, it can also be trained on uh, the, the collection of small molecules. Now back to Annie, uh, they also use uh, the baylor Palinello neural network architecture. So mini so it's actually the same architecture as the ones that I have used before. So it's really by a choice that I didn't train uh, our neural network that is that can be generalized uh, to other systems. So it is possible. Okay, so let's go to the uh, like uh, the last 
last last uh, question uh, from uh, Leonardo. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Since you have many experimental phase diagrams, can you use that as an output for your training data set? Like, for example, you can take many studies and artificially create a data file with those data and use that as an output to train, for example, to use as a shortcut for your training data set and your results. You could, for example, take the structures from your database already and compare it to the results that are published and use that as a way to try and, how can I say that, smooth out the result from your predictions and the FT and such, or am I being... So which which uh, so what what type of uh, experimental uh, observation are, are you referring to? For example, uh, specific heat. You have, for example, you can pinpoint a phase transition from a peak on on that on your specific heat. For example, I work with Hubble models and stuff in search, and generally there is the peak on specific heat and indicates the phase transition. Could you use that, the experimental specific heat, as a way to create phase diagrams as a training data set? Mm -hmm. well, for example, you have the experimental phase diagrams. You can uh, you look at that uh, different papers and try to create that. Or am I right. made a mistake? Right. So I think this, uh, this basically uh, brings this is the issue that we have already. So my my uh, thinking on, on that problem is like, let's say we have a machine learning potential energy surface, right? We also have the uh, that, that we train from uh, DFT and we also have the, the experimental observation. And how do we build a framework that utilize both type of data, right? So uh, this hasn't been done. And uh, my, uh, my hunch is that one way of doing it is basically to have your experimental observable also into, your, into the loss function when we train, right? But then this is not obvious because when we train the machine learning potential against DFT, we are basically matching the energy and forces but the experimental observable, particularly the heat capacity and all that, and heat diffusion that you have mentioned, they are very, they are, uh, they, they, they are not a simple function of the atomic configurations. They are not directly related to the atomic environment. They are rela related to the uh, atomic configurations in a very, very complex kind of way. So it's not completely obvious that how do we build this loss function that also incorporates experimental observable, although in principle, this can be done. Okay, thank you. That answered my question. Thank you. Okay, so I will say this is, that's all for the day. Like, uh, do organizers have something else to say? No, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'll remember the next session it's earlier, right, Asia? It's yes, exactly. Next session is at 12.30 European time. So just check what is your, in your time zone one half hour earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we and can. Thanks very much for organizing. Thanks to you, Vinking. Thank you very much again. It was Pleasure. a really nice talk. Yeah. I think the participants enjoy it because we are getting really a lot of messages. Uh, so you can read it after. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye